Hello and welcome to today's webinar, The Critical Role of Infection Control Plays in Your Community, brought to you by Sodexo Seniors. I'm Austin Montgomery, a reporter with Senior Housing News. Today we will examine how a proactive approach to infection control and an experienced partner can help create a safe and healthy environment where your residents will thrive. <clears throat> We are joined by Sodexo Healthcare Infection Prevention Specialist, Brooke Hosfeld, Sodexo Seniors Environmental Services Solution Design Director, Harold Jones, and Miami Jewish Health Infection Prevention and Control Director, Juan Bracco. <clears throat> Brooke brings over a decade of experience regarding infection control to Sodexo Healthcare and previously worked as Infection Control Practitioner and Emergency Preparedness Coordinator at Weiss Memorial Hospital in Chicago. Harold joined Sodexo Seniors in 2011 before being promoted to his current role. Before joining the company, he worked as assistant director at Holy Cross Hospital and Children's National Medical Center in Maryland. Juan is a certif certified as a board infection control and epidemiology, and he holds a nursing degree from the University of Phoenix, where he completed a master's in science of nursing. All, thank you for being here today. Just to cover some objectives for today's webinar, uh, we will look to address the current expectations and requirements that communities are facing when it comes to complying with regulations from the Centers for Medicare and Medicaid Services, also known as CMS. We'll also examine how a proactive approach to infection control and an experienced partner can create a safe and healthy environment where residents thrive. And we will also explore Sodexo Seniors how Sodexo Seniors is partnering with the community to enhance their infection control program and improve overall resident satisfaction. Uh, just a few housekeeping items before we begin. Uh, we welcome questions from the audience at any time. Please submit your questions through the question section on GoToWebinar, and we will get as many as through as many as we can as possible. I'd like to now hand it over to Brooke to begin today's presentation. Thank you, Austin, and thank you to all of the participants who joined us today. Next slide, please. So there are a number of challenges that have been presented to our senior living facilities. You know, during the, the height of the COVID uh, pandemic, you know, pop populations in these uh, facilities really started to dwindle with younger members opting to keep their parents or other elders at home. But this is now starting to reverse as things return to, you know, what we all call the new normal. And with the growing population of retirees and individuals who require more specialized care, more of these individuals will be moving into these communities in the coming years. Now, CMS has recognized this trend and has begun to enact more regulations to ensure that these populations are protected from infectious diseases. Next slide, please. So senior living facilities are not the same as acute care hospitals, which is, um, you know, within my, my job role is what I mostly deal with. Um, but, you know, residents of these facilities are at a greater risk of illness, and many of these illnesses can lead to death. Um, typically, anywhere from one to three million serious infections occur in skilled nursing facilities, and you know most of these, up to about 70%, are said to be preventable. Next slide. So now I'm just going to take a few minutes to cover some of the new uh, CMS initiatives that have been put into place for senior living facilities as of uh, February of this year. So since the COVID pandemic really presented a unique challenge for senior living facilities, you know, residents were accustomed to co-mingling with other residents, so eating together, attending social events together, and the like. And since these events were known to promote transmission within residents of these facilities, CMS has begun to look at ways to lessen crowding in areas in an effort to prevent the spread of illness. Next slide. So as I said, CMS, you know, they've begun to take a closer look at some quality metrics, uh, very similar to those that are monitored at our acute care sites. And these are all part of the value-based purchasing programs. So reimbursement rates are now being linked to items such as staff turnover and patient to staff ratios 
and senior facilities can now be penalized just like acute care facilities are for not providing adequate care for its residents. And again, just like with acute care facilities, all quality metric data that's collected from senior living facilities is publicly available to view on CMS's website. So another item that is monitored, again, very similar to acute care, is the prescribing or overprescribing of antibiotics and other medications. So inappropriate antibiotic use can lead to a number of other issues, such as multi-drug resistant bacterial infections, chronic unresolved infections, and particularly in the senior community, uh, C. diff infections. So CMS now requires senior living facilities to have an antimicrobial stewardship program in place to monitor antibiotic use um, and recommend alternative therapies or to continue, discontinue that use in patients. So as I wrap up my portion of the presentation, I want to take another moment to cover one of the latest CMS updates for senior living facilities. And this is really around um, having an infection prevention professional on staff. Um, this is now a requirement for all senior living uh, facilities. Not only do they have to have an IP on staff, this person also needs to be working on site. Um, in the past, they could be working remotely, maybe as part of a, you know, uh, an acute care facility that had a, an associated nursing facility with it. That's no longer allowed. You have to be on site. And this IT's role is crucial for developing standards of care to prevent the spread of illness throughout the residential community. And there's now specialized training courses and certifications for IPs that are specifically working within the senior living communities. Um, so that ends my section. Now I'm going to turn things over to Harold Jones, Sodexo's Environmental Services Solution Design Director and Support for Facilities Management in our senior segment. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, Brooke. Ne next slide, please. So creating a pro proactive infection control program begins with the goal of providing the safest environment for our resident, resident staff and visitors. We want to start with a comprehensive assessment, identifying potential threats uh, such as MRSA, C. diff, influenza, influenza uh, norovirus, and SARS-CoV-2, which leads to COVID. Um, we want to assess the staffing, the training, the equipment in the facility, the cleaning products and tools. Um, we want to learn if the community is set up for a sustainable infection control program. So when we're establishing um, the, a tailored disinfection program, uh, we want to take a zero approach to build staffing models that provide sufficient staff to properly disinfect and clean the community. We want to identify the required equipment that supports industry best practices, that deliver results, and that create staffing efficiencies. We also want to implement chemicals, tools, and practices that are which are the core of our reassure infection control program. Providing initial and ongoing training to educate staff on job specific tasks, proper usage of chemicals and tools, equipment, safety training, and protective and personal protective equipment. And then finally, we want to we want to make sure we're utilizing tools that promote accountability. Uh, and establish key performance indicators which facilitate uh, performance improvement, employee engagement, awareness, and professional growth. And then the result of all of a proactive approach to infection control, including the tools, training, education, accountability, uh, what, what we're going to do is create a, an environment where residents can thrive and then your facility is in a constant state of readiness, which, which, um, excuse me, which, which will actually, when we have COVID-19 arriving at our doorsteps, we're going to be prepared already to accept those challenges. Um, I know I served as a GM 
um, in one, one of our larger facilities in Maryland during COVID-19 and, you know, the constant feedback that we received from residents that, you know, they felt that we were doing everything possible um, to protect them during COVID-19. For me, as a, as a healthcare professional, that was one of the most rewarding experiences of my career. Next slide. So the Reassure Infection uh, Control Program. The core of our Reassure pro Proactive Infection Control Program is it begins with our service operations team that design our processes and procedures to meet and, ex and exceed regulatory requirements. These processes and procedures are reviewed by Sodex the, the Sodexo Medical Advisory Council. And this is a governance, a, a governance body comprised of experts from around the world of epidemiology, and they're also experts at pandemic planning and operations planning. The regulatory requirements, um, excuse me, um, when, when, when we start looking at CMS and, and, uh, and regulatory guidelines and the things that CMS is looking for in an infection prevention program, they want to make sure we're using a registered EPA hospital grade disinfectant with minimal contact times uh, and reassure we use single use mops and wipes that minimize the possibility of cross contamination. Uh, we have a strong focus on, uh, on initial and ongoing training on cleaning procedures, PPE and safety. And the use of these products create a 99.9 reduction in germs through disinfection. And just like we said, some of the big names, CDF, MRSA, VRE, norovirus, hepatitis C. So we incorporate, we also incorporate UVC technology, such as our Solaris robot into cleaning processes to strengthen the effect, effectiveness of the cleaning uh, program. UVC disinfection uh, is uh, basically three to seven minute cycles that reduce pathogen load and uh, after manual cleaning to combat hidden germs and things that we can't see. This is ideal for resident rooms, clinical spaces, and high touch services. And then also uh, we're introducing a sure wash hand hygiene training technology to our clients to assist in reducing healthcare, healthcare acquired infections with hand washing compliance and proficiency. We're currently running a successful pilot with several of our clients uh, with promising results thus far early in the stages of the pilot. Next slide. So in an infection, in a proactive infection control program, um, it's going to have a, some strong assessment tools that establish uh, and measure performance and also establish accountability. So in Reassure, we utilize the site management system to track activities, uh, perform inspections, support labor allocations, train employees, measure performance and assess risk. The site management system is an online portal which gives the manager complete control over activities in the community through, through the use of over 20 applications that are also accessible through mobile applications. So while the manager's out performing inspections, they can use the, the, the mobile uh, they could use the mobile app, app to uh, perform quality assurance inspections, uh, perform black light inspections, which is monitoring the cleaning of high touch services. We also have client scorecards, which track client-driven uh, client uh, key performance indicators. These tools create a system where key performance indicators are measured and the data is used to facilitate performance improvement. We are also able to perform condition assessments and, uh, or facility observation reports, which bring issues to our client's attention that are causing potential risk and hazards. Next slide. Just some other tools uh, that we have in the toolkit, uh, Ecolab clean signage, which build residents' confidence um, with posters and tent, tent cards that are strategically placed throughout the community 
Uh, the clean signage gives residents confidence that the community is being cleaned with tools and procedures that have been approved by the Medical Advisory Council, Council and the guidelines of CDC. Physical distance signs, which we used all during COVID um, to keep our residents safe. And then we also have Bureau Veritas audit and certification. And this is a third party certification for our facilities. Uh, Bureau, Bureau Veritas is a world leading testing inspection and certification, certification firm that comes into the community and conducts a 50 point operational audit. And, and Juan's gonna talk a little bit more about that because uh, he actually had that uh, audit in his facility. Next slide, please. So why a strong partnership matters? You know, first you have the experience and expertise, um, our industry knowledge. There's a network of thousands of knowledgeable professionals who all share a common goal of wanting to provide the safest environment for our residents. Uh, chain supply access. Um, so we have hundreds of accounts that are using the same products every day in every location, and it creates the vendor relationships. You know, our 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 vendors know that our residents are a high priority. You know, they know the needs of our residents. And then we have SMS, which provides the necessary tools for accountability to meet our clients and our residents' expectations. And then finally, you know, building community confidence. You know, um, I, I tell you, when when uh, when we went through COVID. Um, and, and afterwards, the aftermath, um, you know, I get a lot of questions from administrators and healthcare professionals throughout the country. And one of their key concerns is, hey, you know, from res coming from residents is that now that we've moved, you were moving uh, out of COVID or out of that, you know, that period of anxiety, so much, where there was so much anxiety, residents are concerned, like, what are we doing now to keep residents safe? And you know, and this comes from when COVID started, you saw uh, all of these new gadgets and machines, these folders come out into the market and, and you know, people were using these folders to fog, to clean facilities and disinfect. And now that we've moved out of that, you know, that period of anxiety, you don't see those machines anymore. And in fact, a couple of accounts that I went to visit uh, were, you know, I, open closets and you can see the, the machine in there uh, collecting dust. And, you know, to answer that question for, for our residents, you know, with the Reassure uh, program, we were COVID ready before COVID started. We, we were using the same tools, the same processes, the same chemicals before COVID, during the height of COVID, and we're still using them now. And, and that is the benefit of having a proactive infection control uh, program. Um, you know, you're going to be ready at all times for such challenges such as COVID-19. Thank you. I think it's my part already. Excuse me, uh, I, I, I'm sorry, Juan. I'd like to introduce Juan Bracco, the Director of Infection Prevention and Control for Miami Jew Jewish Health. It's totally okay, Harold. This, this is a very organic and learning process for everybody. So good afternoon, everyone. Uh, it's a total honor to interrupt with all of you today and talk about what I personally consider a very critical area in any healthcare setting. And thank you, Selexa, for the opportunity to bring my experience um, as, a, as a vendor and uh, as this partnership with you guys. So um, Miami Jewish is an organization with 80 years of history that has been built with a focus on tomorrow's honoring and rich life with empathy, purpose and grace leading sources of healthy aging through our innovative continuum of care with our care values guiding principle for our actions. For people who are attending this webinar that are in a different state, Miami Jewish Health is located in Miami-Dade County in Florida. And we are a facility with 412 deaths and more than over 
a thousand healthcare workers between our all Miami Jewish employees and our vendor partners. Um, the infection control program at Miami Jewish Health is based on an initial risk assessment uh, with a meticulous analysis of the data from the previous year, this, for the previous fiscal year. Uh, when the objective to create and implement strategies that allow Miami Jewish Health adopting best infection prevention practices. And this is to avoid difficult cases in area that can compromise residents and staff, basically to our community. The collaboration between um, Miami Jewish and Sodexos uh, in the infection control program started uh, on July 2021 we now review of our initial assessment. The review uh, take two part of considering that the environment serves as a reservoir for a variety of microorganisms that is related, implicated in disease transmission effect in immunocompromised population. Keep in mind, guys, us as a nursing home, this is uh, basically our uh, community a lot of resident wound immunocompromised situation. Um, those um, inadvertent exposure to environmental opportunities may result in infection with significant mobility and mortality. And the lab to adhere in established standard guidelines can result in adverse patients outcome in healthcare facilities. We now doubt working with Sodexo during this insertion as an extended family, which is that's why we consider it so as an extended family, because we have a mutual goal. We have to prevent any outbreaks of any um, mortality during our in, in our uh, to, for our community. This is gives us the opportunity to um, for the environmental operational system to keep focus on, on maintaining the overall cleanness in our facility and ensure that the environment is healthy and safe in mutual collaboration, of course, with the established infection control program. Let's keep in mind that we now an effective infection prevention and control is impossible to achieve quality healthcare delivery. Infection prevention and control affects all aspects of healthcare, including hand hygiene, surgical sites infections, infection safety, antimicrobial resistance, which is a very hot topic nowadays, and how the facilities operate critical situations. Next slide, please. <clears throat> Our main objective is to develop uh, environment infection prevention and control guidelines that review and refer strategies to prevent an environmentally mediated infection, particularly among healthcare workers and immunocompromised residents with recommendations that are basically on best evidence practices. This is also create and implement strategies that allow us to adopt the best practices for cleaning and disinfection creating a system that allow us to identify opportunities and improve the system. And also to demonstrate our commitment to maintain a safe and healthy environment for our residents, employees, and visitors with a focus on maintaining the overall safety of our community, especially during the last past two years. So this is concluding with the results and infection strategies and engineering control when considering implemented are effective in preventing opportunities environmentally related infections in immunocompromised population. We have to keep in mind, guys, that this is a totally team effort that is making a grand impact in our community, increasing a focus on health and safety protocol and continuing compliance with CMS and improving in resident satisfaction and reassurance that we put our residents first. Next slide, please. So part of the uh, of the advance in, in, in our partnership with Sodexo was the initiation to get the safeguard label. And this has been the Bureau Veritas 
as a global leader in compliance and introducing a safeguard, hygiene, excellence, and safety level to help businesses to reopen safely and certify establishments that have met hygiene and sanitation standards drive us to go to show and prove the best practice implemented in Miami Jewish. Our success is enhanced by our community receiving the safeguard, hygiene, excellent, and safety level from Bureau Veritas, which is I consider like a we were award like a, the Oscars. So this is a very prestigious award for, for the point of view of infection control. But how was this process? This process started when um, initi initiated when a volunteer application for the uh, Bureau Veritas conducted an inside visitation by the auditor and review audits policies, procedures, and protocol implemented at Miami Jewish Health. This revision was focused in our environmental services covered by, of course, our partnership with Sodexo System and Miami Jewish Health interim prevention uh, policies on control. And also to all the recommendations that we have been implementing as, a, as a interim policies to prevent COVID-19 with the objective to demonstrate compliance, providing an extra layer of assurance to our residents, employees, and visitors. This is drive us through to our ongoing focuses, which is continue to be in compliance with existing, existing environmental infections control measures will decrease the risk of healthcare association infections among patients, especially the immunocompromised and healthcare workers, and also to demonstrate compliance and provide extra layer of assurance to our residents and visitors. And increase our residents' satisfaction with the knowledge that we are adhering to the best class hygiene and safety protocols. And that's conclude my participation in this webinar as a partner as a person who has been uh, experienced the struggling on COVID-19, but I've also been um, very lucky to have the help and the system with uh, Sodexo Seniors Program for Infection Control. Thank you. Thank you, Juan, and thank you for sharing your you know, personal story of working at uh, Miami Jewish during, during these uh, difficult times. Um, so just some closing thought, thoughts for today, you know, earning trust and confidence of the residents of your facilities, uh, their families and staff is the cornerstone of any successful senior living community. And that begins with providing a clean, safe and healthy environment. Uh, the expanded infection control survey processes and the CMS regulations that have been put in place are intended to increase protection for your community, reduce infections, and improve their quality of life. So a proactive approach and an experienced infection control partner are essential to you know, achieving that environmental safety, avoiding regulatory penalties, increasing resident satisfaction, and really experiencing overall success within your community. So thank you so much for joining us today. And now we're going to be turning it over for questions and answers. Great, thank you, Brooke, Juan, and Harold for your great presentation. Uh, we'll now have some time for some Q&A uh, sessions. Uh, if there are any questions, please submit those through um, the chat in GoToWebinar, and we'll get to as many as we can. It looks like we have a few in our chat already, so I'm gonna get to those. Um, we'll start off with the first one. The CMS requirements can often be overwhelming to our staff. How can I help them understand why the regulations are necessary and help them connect what they do every day to keep our residents safe with these regulations? Uh, sure, I can take a, a quick stab at this. Um, so, you know, they, they can be overwhelming and, you know, there there are frequent checklists that come out, there's frequent updates that come out, um, but, you know, really the most important part and, and, you know, piece that you can work with your staff is, you know, have regular conversations with them, explain, 
you know, the why and how it fits into your community. You know, they might not understand why they have to put, you know, PPE on when going into a patient's room. But if you, you know, explain it in a way that they can understand that they're, you know, not only protecting themselves from the patient, but pa protecting the patient from them as well. And, you know, keeping it low risk for transmission of infection. You know, if your staff understand these regulations and understand the importance of what it means for your, your residents at your facility, it'll, you know, it'll help them kind of put it front of mind to make sure that these regulations are being followed. Totally agree with Wimbro. So if I can share just a little bit of experience that we have here in Miami too, it is you always want to make your staff to be part of, part of the process, part of the policy, part of the action, part of the strategy. When we have a staff that build is belong to that process, to that strategy, so everything's gonna be even more easier for the system. So some some aspect that we implement here is all the craziness changes of regulations and guidelines, for example, CDC, and have the struggle in when um, what is implemented for the community, what is implemented for healthcare facility. As soon as we implement high standard of education to our staff, when they go of the objective that they feel part of the system, everything's gonna flow even better. Thank you, Brooke and Juan. Um, we'll get to the next one here. Um, now that things have returned to somewhat normal uh, post-COVID, um, do I need to worry about sharing spaces and items with other residents? Uh, I think I can take a stab at this one as well. Um, you know, I think we're we're now in a time where the new normal is going to be living with COVID as just a, a constant virus that's out there in nature, very similar to influenza. Um, it might have, you know, peaks at different times during the year. But I think we've gotten to a point with, you know, vaccinations and hand washing and the other precautions that have been put into place that, you know, I think we are able to start, you know, commingling staff and, you know, being able to share spaces, um, you know, be able to, Say if there's a, a knitting club, you know, you can share the same knitting needle, needles, you can share the same yarn. Um, you know, I don't think we need to be as focused on, you know, staying separated from each other because of risk of transmission. I think as long as well as, you know, we're being taught, you know, good good hand hygiene, you know, proper respiratory precautions, you know cough cough or sneeze into your elbow not into your hands you know making sure that people are staying away from others if they're sick um you know i i think i think this is just the world that we're going to be living in now uh, but i think we should be able to you know start sharing spaces with others definitely um and, and now also, I'm, I'm sorry uh, us and, uh brooke i'd also like to add you know when it comes to wiping down of surfaces, just in, in when we're in the common spaces and we're using pieces of equipment that might pass from one hand to the other, just, you know, just as we've always done, just remembering that, you know, frequently, frequently wiping surfaces is also an important measure just to keep everyone safe in the community. Yes, that's a great point. Thank you, Harold. Definitely. Um, Next question we have, it looks like uh, one of the speakers mentioned conducting a comprehensive assessment of your community's risks. Um, what are one or two things that you would recommend we prioritize as we begin the assessment? Well, I, I, I think I could take that one, Austin. I, I think for me, it's, it's very important from what I've seen uh, in communities throughout the United States. It's focusing, taking a strong focus and a look at the staffing models. And, and that goes throughout all departments. Um, I notice in, in housekeeping departments, you know, there are thresholds to in a skilled care area to how much we can clean, um, how much one person can clean. And I don't think we focus enough on the risk that is involved when you have one person and they're and you look at their assignment and they're cleaning 
40 and 50 rooms, there, there's just not going to be enough time to do a quality disinfection of the surfaces that they are assigned to, and that's going to put our residents at a potential risk. So definitely focusing on staffing models. Interesting. Thank you, Harold. Um, next one uh, we'll get to here. Uh, is the requirement to have a part-time infection preventionist uh, known as an IP uh, in all types of senior living communities? Um, and are there any distinctions between their role at say a CCRC or a skilled nursing facility? So the, now CMS does actually require an infection preventionist to be on staff at um, all senior living communities. They don't necessarily have to be part-time. Um, they can be part-time if it's a smaller, maybe, you know, say 30 bed facility. Um, but, you know, larger facilities such as Wands, Miami Jewish, with more than 400 beds, you're gonna have several IPs working in those facilities to make sure that there's proper coverage of all of the residents and, you know, all of the prevention activities that are in place. Um, you know, there's not really distinctions between their roles um, at different types of facilities. Uh, infection prevention is pretty much the same across the board as far as, you know, your general activities that you're going to be doing. Um, but the training that is now offered, um, they do offer specific training for IPs that are in um, long-term acute care facilities, and then IPs that are in skilled nursing facilities. Um, this is additional training and an additional certification that IPs can get on top of their regular board certification. Um, and it's it's just it goes to show that you know CMS is now recognizing the need. So our you know professional organizations are giving that training to fulfill those needs. Thank you, Brooke. Um, looks like we have one more question to get to. Um, and if please feel free to add any others into our go to webinar chat if there are any other questions. But the last one we'll get to here is one of the common struggles we hear about CDC guidance is the difference between the COVID-19 guidance applicable to the community and the ones for nursing homes. Um, how can we educate the community about CDC guidelines, guidelines for COVID-19? I can take that one um, because it's, it's, it's very, um, Every day is an area here in Miami Jewish. I would say that uh, based on our experience here, there is a misconception, probably a misinformation um, around the community. And maybe it's because we pay too much attention to social media or, or, or the misinformation about the new when CDC updates some guidelines. Um, and of course, they get focused in the community, right? Because the, the, the objective is to um, pass this information to the community. But what we have some kind of a challenging is when our residents and family demanding, for example, we have a resident that it was admitted and uh, the vaccination for COVID-19 status is, is only in compliance with the primary, um, dosages. So in, start, in that instance, we have to place that resident in quarantine. We implement it here for 10 days. And then the families want the resident to get out of the room because CDC says this and CDC says that. Or a resident that has been positive and after six days that has been in the um, COVID-19 unit care, the families basically demand that the resident need to be it um, this, uh, discontinue the transmission based precaution. What I'm, what I'm trying to reach is if we want to pass on information, and especially in nursing home or healthcare facility, that the education is about with our staff how to address those uh, misconceptions to the families member, but also how to educate the families member. There is some guidelines that are specifically, specifically and um, focus on healthcare facility and there's our guidelines for the whole community population but both can be implemented as a just one in healthcare facility it's like that i have 
there's uh, micro guidelines, but that's micro guidelines have two different subsystems. System A, system B. System A is applicable to the community. System B is applicable to healthcare facility. And the families need to keep in mind that is some regulations that we have to be in compliance. So education and information will be the key words. Thank you, Juan. I appreciate that. Uh, that brings us to the end of today's webinar. Another big thank you to Brooke, Juan, and Harold, and to the Sodexo Seniors team for bringing us today's webinar. Uh, thank you also to our audience for joining us, and we hope you have a great day. Thank you all so much.